February. We're here. We are filming on Go Red Day, which apparently I'm the only one that's celebrating. I'm updating my picture. I had a shirt. I just wanted to wear a college shirt okay. for the podcast, but I have oh, a picture. Look at so. you. Look at you. Okay. Oh, then yeah, you this, this, was, this was last. Steven, you could have worn whatever you wanted to wear. I mean, so, wearing it. Yeah. So <laughs> yeah. I have two reasons for wearing red. So obviously, want to give awareness to, I'm reading that from our BJC net. Um, according to the uh, U.S., the CDC, heart disease is a leading cause of death for men, women, and people of most racial and ethnic groups in the United States. So it's a preventable, most cases, many cases, it is a preventable disease. So there's bjc.org slash heart risk to take a heart risk assessment. The other reason I'm wearing red is because I have a Dayton sweatshirt on and Dayton basketball is ranked like 21 right now. So always plugging in the the flyers. (laughs) I got my red on. You got red on. You got red on. Yeah. So always got to, you know, got to make sure people know forefront. Absolutely. So um, So, we finally have Winston on with us. It has been, (laughs) I don't know, we've recently, and that's been on Steven and my part. I didn't have a voice earlier this week. It was just a hot mess. So this is meant to be Winston. Yes. (laughs) Yes. All good. It's all good. Pleasure being here. Thank you all for the invitation. Yeah. Yeah, Awesome. So let me, you know, I'm excited. Let me jump right in. This was a long time coming, like Tracy said, but Winston Wright actually grew up with me down at BJH as one of our fellows coming in 2019. So uh, again, always happy to see him. I haven't seen him in a while, um, but it's like we pick up right where we left off whenever we talk, whenever we see each other. So Winston, we're gonna jump right in. Before you talk about coming to BJC as a fellow, tell us a little bit you know, personal about Winston, um, I guess prior to you coming to BJC that you know I wouldn't even know, maybe some of your personal you wanna share. Absolutely. Um, Okay, we can get right into it. So uh, I was born in Seattle, but raised in Philly. Um, So proud East Coast cat, big city kid. Always tell people my childhood was like, hey, Arnold growing up. So that really is a foundation for just how I see the world. Um, Everything also born in 95. So just got a shout out my generation, the young millennials, old Gen Zers. You're the cusp. You're the cusp. I'm I'm the I'm a I'm a hardy millennial. I'm 80, born in 86. So right. The, and there's some differences, old, right? Yeah, some... big time. Steven's our old one. <laughs> Yeah. Yeah. (laughs) So, uh, you know, had had a chance to grow up, you know, um, with the transition of kind of analog to digital. Right. So very interesting just to see where we are now. Um, Growing up in a place like Philly, we used to have a phrase. You get to see the best of the best and the worst of the worst. Um, It it fluctuates between the fifth largest city and the sixth largest city. But out of all top 10 cities in America, it is the most impoverished big city. Mm -hmm. Um, So there was a strong progressive kind of blue collar uh, liberal environment about Philadelphia. But because it's on the coast, we can get really into detail about like some of the complex issues in our community. So my father was an educator. He served as an administrator, actually as the assistant superintendent for the school district of Philadelphia uh, for Mm -hmm. 10 years. So he managed all the alternative schools in a city with over, you know, 2 million people. Um, so I got exposed to a lot of different stories, a lot of different neighborhoods, a lot of just different, you know, um, pathways that I didn't necessarily have to walk. Uh, and then my mother was an entrepreneur and a community organizer. Um, and so they always were really invested in into our community and they both dedicated themselves to really uh, black and brown communities in particular um, in the cities that we lived in. So with that background, with that foundation, uh, you all can imagine I wanted to be a superhero growing up. You know, I had all of these dreams about changing the world and making things better for, you know, vulnerable communities. Um, so throughout high school, uh, I developed a love for science, um, really actually was interested in engineering um, at first, uh, but quickly realized, like, I don't like coding and doing stuff on a computer <laughs> and it's hard to get these robots to work. Like, no, thanks. Um, so pivoted, yeah, pivoted to uh, healthcare going into undergrad, um, and was lucky enough to go to two HBCUs. Um, I went to Fisk University, uh, which is in Nashville. Graduated from Fisk with my bachelor's in biology in 2017, uh, and then went to Morehouse School of Medicine in Atlanta um, and got my master of public health um, at Morehouse. And at Morehouse, I discovered my passion for hospital administration. I was lucky enough to do a uh, internship at Duke University Hospital in the summer of 2018, 
where I really was exposed to just the ins and outs of the business, really understanding how do you impact, you know, health equity outcomes um, from that administrative perspective, and also met a lot of people that were formerly BJC employees. Uh, and my mm -hmm. wife just finished her PhD, uh, just finished defending her dissertation a few weeks ago uh, from Congrats. WashU. Congrats. Thank you. Thank you. That's so awesome. when I was, absolutely. So when I was finishing my internship at Duke, graduating from Morehouse, uh, I knew I wanted to move to St. Louis because my then girlfriend was here. Um, and so one of my mentors was like, you know, there's this place called Barnes Jewish Hospital. It's a pretty good, you know, organization. They have this fellowship. I think you should apply. And uh, that's all she wrote. So that's a little bit um, just about me, my background, how I got here. Outside of work, love uh, soccer, basketball, boxing, uh, making music, um, and have a podcast and do a bunch of other stuff in the public health world um, as well. So, yeah. Right. So I'm going to jump right in. Um, I'm, I got a million questions that you can imagine. But let's start before we get to, to BJH. Mm -hmm. You just hit some major cities. So Philly, mm -hmm. Nashville, Atlanta, and yes. now St. Louis, right? So take me through similarities, differences that you've seen oh, that's in a great all question. of these cities um, and their culture. The community, because yes. uh, you know, I went to school in Nashville. Similar is there. I have family in Atlanta, but I didn't live there. And then, of course, us being in St. Louis. So, give me your your lens, looking through Winston Wright eyes, of uh, as you progress from going home to venturing mm -hmm. out. Like, man, this is the same. Oh, this is you know that's yeah. Right there. Go ahead. I I love that question. I'll try to be as succinct as possible because I've, I've lived in quite a few different places. Um. Mm -hmm. You know, me living in all these different cities has really given me a better appreciation of what it means to be American. I don't mean to start off poetic and preachy like that. Um, but, you know, in a place like Philly, uh, we have a very unique culture. Um, you know, I don't even talk like how I would talk, you know, if no. I was on a meeting with people right. from back home, different, right? Different slang um, at home. Right. A completely different slang, completely yeah. different attitude, our norms, how we interact with each other, just... You know, my wife, she's from a small town in Alabama. And the first time she visited Philly, she's like, oh, this makes sense why you're like the way you are. I mean, you guys, are it's all over the place. It's a bunch of trash. You got to catch this train, this bus, that bus. Like, it makes sense, right? I get I get the stereotypes. So being deeply rooted in a culture like that. Um, and then I went from Philly to Nashville. <laughs> Uh, <laughs> like, you know, did you just feel like you like started slowing down. Like you were like, like was so it, it was it was it was a complete culture shock for me. Yeah, actually, it was it was very challenging. Uh, because yeah. you know every place for better or for worse um has their stereotypes, right? Yeah. They have their their generalizations about another place. So me, a young black kid coming from Philly. All I hear is Will Smith, Fresh Prince, like all the time. So everybody's expecting me to have that energy and be yes. like that. Um, I, I wasn't necessarily like that. So that was one thing. But the culture no, shock and just ex Philly also. That's all they of, know. Absolutely. Yeah. 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 You, see on TV. Like, yeah. you know what? I've never heard that before. You were oh. incredibly unique. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no, and my name starts with a W. So it would always oh. just be, oh, you know, Fresh Prince. Um, but you know, it was hard because of the culture shock, you know, yeah. I was younger. So adjusting mm -hmm. to just trying to make friends with, you know, kids and, and things like that was, um, a bit difficult, but at the same time, I would say because in Philly, you get exposure to every single class, you're going to see extremely wealthy people on the train. You're going to see houseless, you know, or unhoused people on the train, right? You're going to have these kind of relationships. I had the ability, my mom used to say, to move from the outhouse to the White House. That's how she would want me to be. I want you to be able to be on the block and in the boardroom. Right. So just having that kind of upbringing when I got to Nashville after I'd probably say six months to a year, I was yeah. like, okay, I know how to navigate through this culture. Right. Like being in the South and experiencing that culture shock as a young person, particularly among my cohort, that was like a good challenge, but yeah. it gave me the ability to move differently. So I would say that one thing that's a commonality between all the places I lived is every place is unique. Every place has its own history um, that builds the culture, that contributes to the culture, right? Uh, St. Louis has an amazing history, right? Um, so as I moved from Nashville to Atlanta, Atlanta was different, absolutely, because, and this is a very nuanced topic for me, um, it's looked at as like this black Mecca, right? You know, mm -hmm. high concentration of black wealth, amazing professional opportunities um, mm -hmm. for people. 
But when I got there, I was shocked at the amount of homelessness that I would mm-hmm. observe. And these would not be homeless individuals. These would be families, a mother wow. and six children, a mother yeah, and seven yeah. children. We had a, at Morehouse, um, each, we were broken up into little groups and we were assigned to a zip code. Um, and within that zip code was a community partner that we would have to volunteer at for all two years during grad school. And I worked at the biggest food bank in Atlanta. So I could see all yeah. of these families. First name. Come to find out, while it is touted as this Mecca, Atlanta, I think, is in top three cities for income inequality in the country. Um, mm-hmm. Philly's also <laughs> in the top three, which is not great. Um, and so that made me realize, like, oh, wow, OK, there's opportunity everywhere, no matter how great, you know, it is. And um, it was different. It was just it was a culture shock there as well for me. Even being at Morehouse, I still had to adjust to, to that environment. Mm-hmm. So moving to St. Louis, <laughs> this was the final frontier for me. You know, I was born in Seattle, lived in Philly, I lived in Nashville, lived in Atlanta. I was like, I really haven't lived in the Midwest before. Maybe this is gonna be like Chicago, because I love Chicago. Yeah. And people were like, <laughs> no. <laughs> people, when I moved here, they were like, "This is." You probably just saw my like reaction Chicago. of like, "Oh, Winston." <laughs> exactly. <laughs> they were like, "No," and they were like, "Look, man, you are getting ready to go to a terrible place. Why are you moving here? You know, I, do you, don't you know your history?" And I'm looking at them like, you know, I've been there a couple of times. I, I really liked it. You know, my wife she talks about Washu as if it's yeah. good. Like, I don't oh, know right, what right. you guys are talking about. It took me to move here to really understand the actual context and what people say. And so I won't, Stephen's probably heard this a thousand times back in the day, so I won't beat a dead horse here, but St. Louis and Philly are actually very unique, very similar, right? Um, the, the young person in me, if I'm stepping out aside of my badge for a second, I would classify them as hood cities. The street, they're tough places and mm-hmm. always been tough places, in my opinion, even in St. Louis's heyday, you know, it's mm-hmm. boxing city, a lot of good reputation, you know? Um, and so within these kind of cities, it's always inter- interesting to observe the status quo, to interesting and interesting in observing like how cognizant people are of the actual issues within the cities. And again, like I said, because Philly is such a cosmopolitan place, we had no issues talking about one neighborhood versus the other neighborhood, one zip code versus the other zip code. These were conversations I was having with everyone Uh, Every shade of the rainbow uh, when I was in high school. That was my norm with my friends, parents. We talked about these kinds of things. The difference in St. Louis was people do not talk about these kinds of things. Absolutely taboo to talk about, you know, the history of racial segregation in St. Louis, the history of Jim Crow, which was perfected in St. Louis. St. Louis and Baltimore are two cities that when you look at some of the worst, yeah, yeah, Yeah. when you look at some of the the, the worst outcomes in terms of homicides, poverty, it's St. Louis and Baltimore, but that speaks to the history of Detroit's another one, speaks to just how some of these nasty periods in our, in our, in our history as a country were perfected. And so it was a struggle for me because I have this lens of, I want to help the helpless. And so I'm sitting in rooms with people now at the major employer um, in the state. And people are looking at me like I'm crazy because I'm bringing up what's going on in North city. And I had to adjust to that. That was a culture shock. Like, Oh, okay. It's going to take some time. Um, And I was fortunate enough to be a fellow in 2020 where it really opened up the opportunity for the organization to take a big step. Um, And I had to give you all credit as well, because you are a part of the culture change um, and moving our organization in in a further direction. Um, But that's the biggest difference. And I had somebody tell me, you know, St. Louis is a blue collar town, but we don't do all of that kumbaya stuff. Like, and that was, that was what it was explained to me. Like, so, you know, you need to understand that. And I was like, okay, I got Would you. you classify, I think people always say that's like the Midwest manner. So like, I feel like you can oh, like, sure. the, you know, friends from the East coast that I've had, and I would work in Philly a lot with one of my former jobs. I was in the East coast a lot. You know, you have that direct conversation, you say, it and you can move on. Then mm-hmm. the South probably you said, but in a different passive way. And this is me stereotyping that, but like, you know how people say like what they yeah. feel somehow, how they say it. I feel like in the Midwest, did you experience that Midwest manner that we just don't talk about it? We just say yes. like, and like, I'll just like, yeah, I think it's just not brought up. And if it is, it's just kind of like shut down right away. Mm-hmm. Uh, like, yes, I've heard of it. And then they just move on versus yes. 
addressing the even the elephant in the room or just the reality. Um, and I feel like to your point, once almost 2020 hit, because we were all home, we all then could see the light of it all. We saw health disparities. Mm-hmm. Like I know S- Stephen and I worked on um, the thermo camera, camera mm. from that project. But what was interesting is I learned so many key things there, even just basic differences of human beings that it was brought up of like, we can't even help specific races because a thermo camera won't pick up someone with darker skin color. So we're really uh-huh. not protecting them because technology is not built. They're tested on just typically white individuals. So right. like even learning the basic, like the smartest of smart scientists, that inbuilt functionality that we don't think about, I think brought it up a lot. But to your point too, I've born and raised, went to university, everything in the Midwest, but you definitely, you've brought up so many things, Winston, that I was like, yeah, that tracks, that tracks, <laughs> that it is around the boardroom. Like, we know it's an issue, but like, we'll think about it later. Right. Yeah. Midwest niceness was something that, yeah. uh, th- that I had to adjust to as well, yeah. but it's been yeah. the best challenge for me. Yeah. Um, because I feel like it gives you different ways to talk about, introduce and influence conversations. So it's been yeah. good actually being yeah. here. So what yeah, have been no, some okay. ways that you, oh, I'm sorry, oh, Steven. No, yeah, what have been some ways that you did introduce that conversation and help just shift a little bit and lean into the Midwest nice to help mm-hmm. bring it out from others? So I'll get really, really specific here. Yeah. Um, so again, being on the East Coast, a lot of different people. Uh, so in Philly, we have like a big population of Italian uh, uh, Americans and people mm-hmm. who descended from Italy, right? Mm-hmm. Some of my best friends, South Philadelphia and Italian market every Saturday growing up was down there. So I was always used to being around people that were not like me. Um, I actually lived in one of the more predominantly Jewish neighborhoods um, in Philadelphia as well. So I felt really close to that uh, kind of American pioneering Ellis Island type of culture, type of vibe, right? Um, So, and I knew the Midwest had that same history. I knew St. Louis has some very prominent history here, right? Um, With all these different cultures. What I came to realize quickly, though, is that there were attempts at making everyone kind of assimilate. And I was actually in a similar part of Focus St. A seminar, excuse me, a part of Focus St. Louis. And one of the lecturers was like, you know, in the East Coast, there's a lot more pride in your ethnicity and your heritage. But in the Midwest, it's it's still there, but it's less so, right? And more people kind of just all want to be viewed at as one. So one of the things I started doing was like, I can challenge that because I know something about, you know, this, you know, leader or this, you know, team members, culture or heritage. Let me kind of just try to like gently throw it out there. And if it backfires and they look at me like it's weird for you even talking about that. Cool. But if it works, well, hey, now I have an opportunity to have some real conversations. So I did that. I would, especially as a fellow, I would, you know, in my one-on-ones with certain leaders, I would just test the waters and say things that either could make them, you know, tell me to get out or make them really lean in. And fortunately, uh, everyone's leaned in. Everyone has leaned in. And so now, again, I feel like I have a skill set. I also think it's about meeting people where they are. Um, One of the conversations that I think was really interesting during 2020 was uh, the Blue Lives Matter versus Black Lives Matter. Sorry that I'm going super political here, y'all. I don't know if y'all like. We've been we there. We've been there. Oh no, um, we, we yeah, run the gamut. Bold. You're good. You're <laughs> okay. Good. Okay. Yeah. Keep going. Yeah. Um, okay. So you know, I remember sitting in in a seat where I was able to comment on this, right? And I was just like, you know, I don't think either groups are truly at odds with each other. It's just a perspective that you know supporters of either movements have, right? So do I expect? all police officers to know the history of policing in the United States and how it really evolved uh, from a period during slavery? Absolutely not. I think that's a little too much. But do I expect, you know, the officers to understand the sensitivities around certain communities that they police? Absolutely. I think that's a just a professional expectation. At the same time, as a civilian, I have to put myself in their shoes. I don't really know what it's like to to openly, willingly face danger um, in the name of protection, right? I don't know what it's like to have to get everyone to bind me and build trust as soon as I show up to the scene so people can really be confident. I have no idea what that feels like. 
And so, you know, it's been a common theme that oftentimes the powers that be that maintain the status quo want to keep us divided. And if we kind of just take some time to, okay, let me hear your perspective. Let me, you know, just absorb it. I don't have to agree with it, but let me at least try to put myself in your shoes. Then maybe we can, I think we used to do a much better job at that, um, even though I'm not that not that old. Um, yeah. A much better job, though, at just having these kind of conversations where, hey, it's going to be a debate or not even a debate. We may disagree, but let's lean into that. And so that's one example of why I feel like there's middle ground and you just have to know how to tap into that. So if I get on a call and someone wants to talk and they start on a certain side of the spectrum, it's not my job to react to that, to try to talk them out of that or debate them. It's my job to try to find as much parallel and alignment with my own thinking so I can actually start having a productive conversation and planting the seeds. So, you know. The challenge for our listeners, and we've gotten a few new ones since we are included on the uh, connection yeah. email, but I, I think it's almost what I'm hearing is like, let's challenge each other to like push that Midwest nice. We can still be nice. Yeah. How do you kind of push that to still be nice and have dialogue? Um, Absolutely. So yeah. I really like that example, though, Winston. I think you you brought up a great, which is something that at it affected us all, and everybody has a thought on it, um, in, in some way. Sorry, I have kindergartners running in the background after a half day. <laughs> oh, right. no spirit, no it was worries. Spirit Day, so a lot of sugar yeah. was had Ooh, at nice. their school. Fun. It's great. <laughs> and so you know, Winston again coming in this young, ready to to take on the world superhero. You know, as a meeting, as he alluded to those one on ones, somewhere with me, right? And one thing, and it made me smile, we talked a few months ago, once however long it's been, but you said, man, when you told me, when you come in a room, when you first see people, read the room, everybody you may think is your friend, not your friend, everybody you think is your enemy, is not your enemy. And he came, he was like, you was right. And I was like, <laughs> perfect, because that's something you will use for the rest of your life, as you mm -hmm. come in, you meet people, because it's it's natural to kind of try to, try to, go towards or gravitate towards what we know, but that's not always, you know, their objective and they always don't have our best interest. So one thing I want to call out was I'm, I was proud of you. First of all, you received that, but now you use that, you know, going forward and you meet different people, different levels in all walks of life. And I say, you know, keep that man, read and, and find that connection with you is just making parallel how you and X person can come together versus saying they're over there, I'm over here because it, it'll it'll work wonders for you, man. And, and you always keep that even keel. So you come in, you're a fellow now. Talk us a little bit about your your time at, at BJH <laughs> and, and 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 you know really come into a, a top healthcare organization and hospital in our in our yes. Next. Yes. So my my time as a fellow was very very interesting. Um, I remember asking myself, dang, why did they pick me? Um, out of all of the people, uh, there was eight finalists, and I remember they flew us out. Uh, we spent the first day just having a dinner with all of the vice presidents at BJH, and then the second day, we do an intense round of interviewing um, with the leadership team just pretty much all day as well. Um, and I remember just thinking I was a fool, you know, when I applied. I ended up crying in my interview to Christy Longnecker. She had asked me what motivated me to do this work, and I started thinking about my parents. And it's actually funny. Um, uh, you know, the month, you know, is centered around awareness for heart disease. Um, not funny, but funny. My father passed away from congestive heart failure uh, during my fellowship. And so his experience was one of the things that really carried me. So that's why I ended up crying in front of Christy when she asked me what inspired me. But I thought I didn't get the job. Uh, and the feedback that I got after that, after that was, you know, no, we see your empathy. We see how much passion you have. We understand how much, you know, you really care. And so, you know, I had executives tell me, like, when you get in here, you need to hit the ground running. And I had other leaders, people like Steven, telling me, take the whole year just to look. I don't even try to do anything. Just look. Just observe. Just write notes in every meeting you're going to. Don't, don't be in a rush. Um, and so I kind of did both, right? In the fellowship, and I feel like in any position, honestly, projects are a currency. That's how we get our mobility. That's how we, you know, get our notoriety. Um, prove our competency, right? I didn't have much of that in the first half of my fellowship. So I kind of felt like I was just language languishing. There was always um, opportunities or moments where I felt like, ah, I should have said this. But I used to have this weird thing where my voice would tremble 
if I would try to speak up. You know, I got so I I came in so little nerves, um, little nerves. Yeah. yeah, you know, I, I came nerves. in very bold and very ready. Oh, yeah. Yeah. But once the culture hit me and I just realized how I had to adjust, I shrunk, right? Yeah. So the mm-hmm. first six months were very difficult. At the same time, they were amazing. I had, you know, opportunities to spend a lot of time with food, nutrition, and housekeeping, for example. Um, I got some great mentorship from for uh, from Hillary Harris, who's now the COO at Christian, was a mm-hmm. director and executive director mm-hmm. at BJH yep. when I was there, right? Um yep. Got an opportunity to round with Dr. Lynch while he was treating patients and teaching residents. Um, so I got a lot of good exposure to, to, to the business and understanding the minds. And I graduated with my Master of Public Health. So I came here focused on health outcomes. And so it would be common. I would be sitting with an AM or a nurse educator, you know, and I would be start talking about like health disparities and health inequities. And at the time in 2019, there wasn't much knowledge about it at all. And so I was like, oh gosh, I'm in the wrong place. <laughs> like, this is what I, I came here to do this. And my initial interest was ex- helping to expand um, our ambulatory platform across the system. I really wanted to, I was interested in seeing what are we doing in our outpatient space. And I think we're doing some great things, but at the time it wasn't as ramped up as I wanted it to be. So I was kind of left in limbo. Um, at the same time, I can understand and observe the need for diversity, equity, and inclusion. I actually told all the executives when I started my fellowship, I'm not here to be the diversity guy. I can't speak to, you know, all these different people's experience. Just because I'm a young Black doesn't mean that that's what I necessarily want to do. But after going through the different experiences that I had, connecting with other people, really on the front line, um, I told myself, oh, this, there's a need for this. Like there, there's an actual need for this work at this organization. Um, and it would benefit me to try to make this work tangible um, and really try to make it impact uh, the business while I'm here. Uh, and so that led me to thinking about it. And then of course, 2020 happened. Um, and I'll tell this story uh, and I'll wrap this part up. This is probably the highlight of my fellowship. So 2020 happened, COVID is the first thing that kind of breaks off. So as fellows, we're pretty much like extra admins for all of the leaders at BJH. There's this big incident command center. We're going in every single day, 13 hours a day. It was crazy, crazy times, right? For all of us. Um, there's There was news that started to come out probably a month or two into the pandemic that, hey, some of the deaths that we're seeing are in communities of color. And all of these news stories started popping up across the country where in every major city, first death that we've accounted for, person of color in St. Louis, in St. Louis City, um, both of them were former healthcare workers and they were both black women. One was 30, the other one was in her 60s. And nobody was talking about this in the incident command center. And I get it. I understand that it's busy. It's a, it's a global pandemic. This time is unprecedented. But at the same time, we need to start talking about this because this could potentially impact some of the solutions, right, that we are developing. Even if it comes from a, what communities are we targeting and where are we seeing the higher volume of cases come in where we can maybe deploy vaccinations first there, all these different types of things. Right. The team eventually got to that, but it took months. And by the time that it took months, I had already told myself, I'm going to have to be in a position where I can be comfortable enough to bring this kind of stuff up. This was a global pandemic. I didn't really talk about it. Not too many people talked about it when we first had the opportunity. How many lives could have been saved if we would have had these conversations? And we all did an amazing job. So that's not Mm -hmm. taking away from anything that any of us have done. But that was something that really pushed me to say, I'm going to do this. Then after we're kind of figuring out how we're doing this COVID thing, Breonna Taylor, George Floyd, Ahmaud Arbery. So that reopened up. And I'm in, and mind you, while this is happening, I've already been going through my own racial equity journey just by moving to St. Louis. Right. So now here is a global platform for everyone to stop, say, hey, this is going on. We need to acknowledge this. So uh, our CEO, our leader, fearless leader, Rich Lightwig, he's actually someone that I had a relationship with prior to joining the organization. Um, just one of my friends in grad school was 
one of Rich's mentees, and so I was lucky enough to get that uh, connection. Yeah, Rich shout, out out, Kine, shout out to Kenny. Shout out to Yes, really yes, good person. I already yeah, know. Yeah, I, my yeah, brother. Uh, yep. I'm, I'm going to have to send this to him. That's hilarious. Yeah, that's my, uh, that's, that's, that's my guy, man. He, I got you. He's yes. a few times with me around Big Barn, man. Good person, man. Maryland, yes. right? Yes, Maryland. Maryland, yeah. Maryland. Um, so, uh, Rich, you know, and I had always had a good relationship. Um, so Rich puts out a statement. He put out a really groundbreaking statement in 2020 and there's so much conversation going on. Uh, and like my cohort, all of my peers, they're like, you know, Winston, if you want to respond to him, like you're the person to do it. And I wrote a letter to like the young professionals at BJC that I know just to give them my thoughts. Like, this is what I think about what's going on in the world right now. So one of my colleagues, uh, they were like, you need to send this to Rich. Like, you have that capital. Like, you can do it. Like, and I was just like, I don't know. <laughs> like, that's kind of crazy. Because what I was saying in, in my letter was a response to his letter. Um, but I ended up sitting on it. And I was like, man, Rich is a cool guy. Why not? Um, so I sent him the letter. He reads it that same night. And then he invites me to a meeting with uh, himself, Bob Cannon, who was the president of BJH at the time, and then Jackie Tischler, who was just joining and is now our chief people officer. So it's me for an hour and 15 minutes talking to these leaders about racial inequities in St. Louis, how they seep into our organization, some of the things that their own reports may not tell them, and just having like a no holds bar conversation. Uh, and I ended that conversation with huge pit stains, uh, <laughs> sweating. I was so nervous. But Rich uh, just gave me the green light. He was just like, look, you know, you have the ideas, you have the lens, you have the knowledge, you know, step into this. And once I got the confirmation for him, that's really um, all she or he wrote. And, and that was my fellowship experience. And that's how it ended as well. That was 2022 end of 2021 and uh we are here that's awesome yeah and let me i remember we had a call you said hey man i don't know if i'm being here any longer but i, just, you know, I appreciate it <laughs> this is what he said i said man no i'd be fine I, and and then you told me after you met with him how awesome it was but um when i would say let me take one step back i don't think and this is me personally if covid didn't happen winston would have stayed would have been here Cause he was, he was like, man, I don't know how you do it, man. And I, mean, I could tell you, remember that? Yeah, he's like, absolutely. Do it, Steve and, all. and I'm like, man, just stay the course. You're all right, man. And then also, I remember, it was funny, like yesterday, you're like, man, how do you do it? You go in there with John and you talk. I said, just yes. be yourself, Winston. Take a deep breath. Mm -hmm. Because, you know, in our role, Tracy, that's where yep. we live, right? So I always tell mm -hmm. Winston, I said, man, you're in that room for a reason. You're not there just yep. to sit there. Be Winston mm -hmm. when you're in that room. And I'm, mm -hmm. again, proud of you because that's moving forward and that's yeah. who you are. But, um, you know, reaching out to Rich, like you said, leaders and his direct reports wouldn't have done that, hadn't done that, mm -hmm. didn't do that. And for right. you to do that, that's, man, above commendable. And yeah, you need to take awesome. that letter. Uh, um, frame it. And print it and frame <laughs> it. No, I, no, yeah, I think, no, really, I'm, I think I'm that's just like a good reminder. When you talk about history, that's mm -hmm. a history that your kids, your grandchildren, when we went through COVID, right? Mm -hmm. And like, man, mm -hmm. you can share that piece. This was a part of what was yeah. going on with dad at the time and wow. the health yeah. organization that I was with. Wow. I'm dead serious. No, that I really think you should. I, I agree, Stephen. Yeah, that's tremendous. And I hope this inspires others to think, too. Because Stephen and I talked about it. people are like, oh, how'd you start this? Like, Stephen and I just wanted to do it. And mm -hmm. we just kind of started on the ground of like, we just want to hear from people across the organization. And that's when like Jackie Schisler reached, you know, was watching Maria Garrettson's a big fan, but like mm -hmm. we're starting to get other people and it's like, it's leaning into doing it and asking the leaders just to have a voice and, right. and giving a platform to others. And I think to your point, like Rich probably would never have no, like, probably heard, but sometimes you need to hear in a very different way. And yeah, I mean, he, I think that that shows also what great leadership we do have at BJC Absolutely. because they're not on this high palace afraid to go in. It's, he does respond. He does reply. He does receive. Um, and you're not just getting like an out of office reply, you know, auto Absolutely. reply. But I think hopefully that tells others it's okay to voice it. I remember Andrew Schutte, who used to work here, he mm -hmm. led. That was my co-fellow. Yeah, that was oh! my co-fellow. Yes. Oh, he's, <laughs> so I worked with him like, on working parents. He, he had learned, like we worked on. Yeah, um, lactation rooms across the mm -hmm. system because he was like i'm a new dad 
my wife is struggling. What is going on? It was like, let's do something about it. So I think it's showing like, if you want that change, it, you don't have to have a title to make change. Um, but I also resonated with you, Winston, of that sometimes your throat closes up. Like I was talking with my my leader recently. This She's like, I just need you to lean in more. Because I'm always like, well, I want to see what someone else writes first. Because I don't want to be wrong. <laughs> and I'm actually working with my kindergartner on that right now. Of mm. like, she's like, I'm afraid to cut straight or do all these things. And so like, we're like, it's okay to be wrong. And learn mistakes yeah. can be messy. And it can be a beautiful right. mess. And she's I'm actually, surprised at you, Tracy. Right I would never right guess that you were... <laughs> You were having that discussion with Jeremy. I was surprised. Oh, yeah. I mean, because it's yeah. like when those new subjects come in or sure. you have new team mm-hmm. members, you're just like, I, I, yeah, you're trying to lead the room. How will they yeah. receive it um, mm-hmm. and have that balance? And so, but yeah, I mean, it's so much to be able to have that opportunity or when we've talked with people in technology that they're like, well, I would never talk to Jerry. You know, when he walks down the hall, you're like, I what? mean, <laughs> I, I trash talked Jerry, Jerry on a town hall of Notre Dame, and Ohio State, <laughs> and then I lived to see the next week when Ohio when Ohio State beat Notre Dame, and he still trash talked <laughs> me back. Like, and yeah. he's still doing it in other meetings, and I'm not there. But right. it, I think exactly. it just hopes to show people like people are reachable, and and yeah, and and I love that people lifted you up, and and really, Wednesday night, Stephen, you're so right. Save that, like. My si- I know I'm going on a tangent, but my sister-in-law and brother-in-law, they were cleaning mm-hmm. out his father's place that had mm-hmm. passed away. They found his resignation letter from Wash U. He, he oh, worked wow. there, was retired. But he was the reason he was going to was because about pay and equity. And he's a wow. black man. And okay. it was back and forth, salary, and here's why, here's what my peers are doing, and stood up for himself of wow. what his retirement plan should be. Mm-hmm. And, and so Ben was just filled with such pride of like, even back, I mean, it would have been like the 70s. Of him wow. sticking up for himself, uh, like, and that's when he knew he's like, my dad had it. Like at that point, like he always had, he always knew he was outspoken, but like also like he fought for what was right, not just for him, but mm-hmm. for the future of people coming in to teach at the university or wherever. Um, so I mean, that's just so he he obviously kept it, but he was like, this was, and he also found the cutest journal. His dad would take notes on dates. Oh, I'm like, wow. how cute is that? But he was like, she looked beautiful. It was like with his not like his wife, but it was just like, I had such a great time. And like, oh, it's like, I hope she calls back and like <laughs> oh, letters funny. they wrote each other. I'm like, oh my God, that's the most wow. adorable thing. Yeah, but but you know it makes that impact even on, you know, a 40 something man. Right. <laughs> um, yeah. You know. Yeah. Letters and handwritten notes were the thing then, though. That's, yeah. something that's we how you used to it. Yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's, that's true. But like, how adorable. But I think Ben seen like that was the human side of his dad. Mm. Of like, dad was always a superhero in many other ways, but it was like, yes. oh, dad struggled too, and he faced yeah. this in his mm-hmm. mind of of what what can I do in this situation? Absolutely, yeah. that I, was their I movies, love that. Bro. Yeah, yeah. we sure. we we had Jerry uh, come to uh, one of the HR town halls recently, and okay. I just have to right. say, you all are just such a great example. I think of how people yeah. want to connect and be engaged with a part of an organization, regardless of the industry. And he gave an example of, uh, I think you all, a part of your, your town halls, the leaders come on with their spouses at some point in time where oh, like, yeah, they've done, done that. that. Yeah, that's been and, yeah. and like, to me, it's just like, how many people even want to be that mm-hmm. vulnerable at work mm-hmm. and really just expose people to their family? I know, you know, we share pictures and do stuff like yeah. that, but a spouse interview, like your partner yeah. on, that is really allowing the team to see you in a different kind of light and imagine just the culture that you're setting. Um, so I put in the chat, like, wow, that is a cool idea. Yeah, um, now, of course, you have to have a leader, you have to have the team, right? But I just think you all are building a culture in a really intentional but organic way. And um, I love I love everything that the IT does, just from an engagement shop. Y'all are so busy supporting so many different aspects of the business, but the fact that you've been able to just stay committed to this work in the same time, because I know it's more than just you all, um, uh, yeah, sure. it's, it's awesome. It's, it's really awesome. It was awesome. Yeah, all right, we're say- gonna, oh, go on. No, go I was gonna say, let's, we can start pivoting to some fun, well, this has all been fun. But like our last time, let's we're gonna do Stephen's lighthearted questions. Well, I got one thing I wanna. I oh, wanna one more. Sure okay, Stephen, do in. it. So, so tell us a little <laughs> bit about the the healthcare hustle. I gotta get that. Oh, in. Yeah, your awesome. podcast. Okay. We'll link it yes. and we'll, we'll yeah. make sure. 
This is really fun. So the healthcare hustle. And I ain't been on there yet, but I ain't, no question. Oh, I I, I, listen, I, mean, I'm, I go home. based off your the one that's <laughs> yeah. But go ahead. No, I, uh, you got to get this in. I, I yeah. love it, man. Go ahead. No, thank you. And it's actually the support in, internally from the organization has been amazing, honestly. Um, so the healthcare hustle podcast is a creative educational platform um, intended to highlight the careers of leaders of color across the healthcare industry. Uh, so I started it with myself and uh, another one of my brothers who is a director at the School of Medicine at WashU now, but was a fellow like me, um, Nigel Williams. We started this because we both felt as fellows like, man, we have great conversations with leaders of color across BJC and WashU. There's this narrative that St. Louis is so bad and we can't attract people here and, you know, all of these issues with racism. But Look at the conversations that we're having. Think about all of the OGs that we know in this city that contribute to healthcare. You know, what can we do to highlight them? What can we do to showcase them and really try to change the brand of St. Louis in terms of a place where young folks of color can come, be inspired, work on issues that will impact communities that reflect them, and also get the mentorship. So that was like the biggest, the first thing. We just want to highlight these people and champion them. So we started out with executives across the organization. Uh, some of our first episodes are either uh, attending physicians at Wash U or directors at BJH. And these would be like very candid, unapologetic conversations let's get into your real perspective as the executive director of uh this we didn't have anyone on the guest like this but transplant services talk to us about the disparities that you see where where are we lacking from a healthcare system and how can we start plugging these gaps these are things that admittedly before 2020 weren't ready to have these conversations in a lot of healthcare organizations but now um we've been able to build a platform where Everyone kind of gets it. When you tune into this show, you're going to hear some real sophisticated health equity talk from people who actually reflect the, the populations we're trying to impact, but also people who have the leadership title and have been doing this thing for a long time. And so it grew to be this thing where like a lot of people across St. Louis that weren't a part of the big fancy organizations wanted to kind of come on the show. So then Nigel and I were like, you know what? We also need to highlight the entrepreneurial environment um, and the startup environment in, in St. Louis, because there's a lot of awesome entrepreneurs of color that are doing amazing things to serve the city. And so that became a facet. And then uh, we started to capture a lot of students and early careers who were just tuning into the show. And so the coolest story I'll, I'll, I'll tell you all just quickly is last year during Black History Month, um, I was bold and I put the podcast on our SharePoint site. And one of the executive directors from one of the women's and infants teams across the system and said, hey, we had listened to an episode of your podcast that was about black maternal uh, health. It was with a Wash U physician, Dr. Ebony Boyce Carter. Um, it's our like most listened to episode now because she mm -hmm. goes in. And this executive director was like, we had a brief conversation about it as a part of our team meeting. Like we had everybody listen to it. And then as a service line, we talked about it. And I was just like, whoa and she told me about this when i we were both joining a meeting she was yeah. like winston i know your name from somewhere oh this is what we did with your podcast and i was just yeah. like oh my God. okay like that, that is success like it. that is good that's so yeah awesome. yeah. yeah so that's it's been it. a success where, where can people find the podcast like spotify so apple we, or oh yeah so we're, we're on all major um okay. all major podcast platforms but spotify apple Podcasts, and youtube is where we host uh okay. we have a linkedin page the healthcare hustle podcast um and also the healthcare hustle podcast.com is um our website and you can right. access everything there and uh we drop uh monthly episodes um okay. so pretty pretty small content batch but they're a good hour and yeah, again just real awesome. talk it's all real talk so. everybody all of okay, our fans make links, sure y'all go we'll check sure. it out go follow yeah. gotcha. go support uh it's awesome <laughs> Yeah, that is awesome. That is, that's when you know you made it. Like, I, I mean, I know we'll I do know some fun that. questions. So to wrap it up, but like Winston, you are, you're changing the world. And I thank you for that. And I'm going to vote for you someday, whatever you're running for. Even know. if it's like school board, <laughs> I don't know. I'll just move to your district and I'll be like, he's good. Like, I don't know. Oh, <laughs> even if it's just for like most congeniality. I'll be like, he's still legit. <laughs> I yeah, appreciate and, and no, no. But no, you really I, are. I you're making a that. difference. Yeah, I yeah. double down with that, Tracy. Don't look yeah. at, you know, moving the boulder, but yeah. you continue to hit it, right? 
as more people hit it, that boulder will move, man. So don't think your work or is, is insignificant or minute, man. All this stuff, that team that you reached, that executive director to utilize, you know, what you were saying, that's huge. Yeah, that right. is huge. Because if you didn't do it, they don't have that opportunity. They don't have that moment, right, to talk that's about true. that. So yeah. keep pushing forward. Um, like Tracy said, now from a lighter standpoint. Uh, first of all, when Winston mentioned soccer and basketball, Winston can't shoot a leg. I got to work with him. No, he no, had, no, no, I'm no. Out here, y'all Winston, Winston. Outside. I'm like, bro, oh, I can't your, your, your kids, your boys and your daughter can go coach him. Don't coach any more basketball listen, video until listen. we shoot together. So that's that one was, thing. This guy. Okay, I'm going to let him have it. I'm going to let him have it. I'm not going to even say anything. Because he, he hit me up. On your, on, your, on, on your free time, you, like... you know, with your family <laughs> or even by yourself when you unwind. What do you, what do you like to do, man? I, I'm a typical guys guy, so very sports heavy. So like literally after 5, 5.30, if there's a Sixers game on, I'm cooking dinner, got the game on, that's what I'm doing. Um, I box a lot, try to box in the morning, head into the gym. Uh, yeah, yeah, just a little. <laughs> to, no, you already know. Um, uh, you know, try to just stay in shape. Um, and then again, love playing basketball every now and then. Um, I try to do about two to three five Ks per year. Um, nice. you know, that, now, you, now you got Tracy like, no, yeah, I got, I got race tomorrow. I do the process. Oh, right wow. Yeah, okay, yeah, that's I'm, nice. Final, final three miles tomorrow. Yeah, wow, that's awesome. Yeah, that's on that. Thank you. Uh, yeah, so just just try to stay active as much as possible, and then love playing pickup soccer um, as, as much as I can, and then also watching a bunch of soccer. So typical stuff, nothing yeah. nothing too much. Nice. Uh, so I gotta say this, Philly, like two of my favorite. First of all, um, uh, Wallow and Gilly, that's one of my favorite. Yeah, games. Come on now. but Let's also go. I like I just I love how open and honest Oskino is. Any interview Oskino <laughs> is on, I'm listening to. Because it's wow. just like having an open conversation with you, man. So shout out to Damn. Philly. Uh, what's a podcast that you listen to that may not be mainstream, but you're like, man, this, Gotta do this, it. these yeah. are gems I get from watching. <laughs> what's, what is uh, something that you listen to like? Okay, first of all, I think it's just funny you 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 name dropped Oskino. I never thought that would happen in a quick no, <laughs> okay, any to, type of Microsoft Teams meeting in front of BJC, regardless <laughs> of the context. Bingo card, done. The real oh, that's person, crazy. man, is Oskino, man. I, I listen um, to every interview. Yeah, go ahead. <laughs> that's funny. Uh, the best podcast that I listen to is called Bad Faith Podcast. And um, yeah, in my in my in my free time, I also am into politics. Y'all probably can tell just a little bit. Um Tracy, I said you so, got our vote. Vote for the list. <laughs> right. The name you yeah. know. Go ahead. Uh, no. Uh, so yeah, Bad Faith Pod or uh, Bad Faith Podcast. It is a podcast by um a woman by the name of Brianna Joy. She it was a political commentator, worked on a lot of campaigns um in the past. And she really uses a lens of independent journalism to present facts on major stories that we would not see. And she has a bunch of political figures, representatives on that are like the others, like that are like the end of that. We would never know. They don't get popularized for particular reasons, obviously. So it makes you go crazy because you get to learn all of these different things that Fox News or CNN aren't showing you. Um, and it makes you even more upset. Uh, but at the same time, it's it's something I listen to probably, if not daily, every other day, um, her podcast. And I even older, older um, things. So yeah, and, and I'll say one more too. Um, there's another one, it's a little bit bigger. Um, it's by the British bod, uh, Broadcasting Company um, and it's called the Global News Podcast on Spotify and Apple. It's a huge podcast, 30 minutes, and it just gives you a download of everything that's going on in the world. Um, and so those are two that I listen to all the time. Those are good awesome. plugs. I love it. Well, Tracy, you want to close this out? Any thoughts or as we yeah. close? Winston, this has been great, man. Um, that's why, you know, the continual buildup, it made it even better, man. I knew it was going <laughs> yes. to be a knockout of the park. So I challenge you. Oh, yeah, one thing. Sorry, Tracy. Pay Good. forward is something that Tracy and I are trying. So who would you suggest uh, from BJC? We always try to get, and these are, uh, Winston, we, uh, I think we said this, or maybe we didn't. We're trying to highlight people that may not be C level or VP level, like, but there's a lot of awesome people that make up our now 40 some thousand with the West region. Right. That make up BJC and make who we are. So you don't have to have it now, but yeah. if you would send us either chat or an email, like, man, this would be a great person for you guys to have on the show. We really appreciate it. Yeah. 
Yeah, I have a bunch of names, but I'll put them Daniel. in the chat. Yeah. <laughs> I'll put them in the, the chat. For, as uh, my favorite, one of my favorite housewives said, for those that let, watch Bravo, name them. That's what Sutton Strap <laughs> said. I'm real housewives <laughs> of Beverly Hills. Yeah. Name them. So. <laughs> all right, well, so this is, I'm just going to throw this out there. This is part one. We will have oh, Winston back for part two <laughs> yeah. and later on in the year, yeah. but um, to see what's going on, because I didn't even get to. Why is there a liquor store in every corner? I oh, gosh. Yeah, so that's all right. Exactly. Yeah. Right? So, okay, you know, I'm there's gonna a lot. Okay. I'm going to pre-book in a few months. We're going to do that. Yep. And I, that's perfect. Sounds good. I love it. I'm and here. so I think our challenge for our listeners and our viewers for this one, as we talked about, Midwest Nice. What does that mean to someone? And how do you challenge that? And start just bringing in the conversation. And just, you know, for that month of February, try to do it this month. I think that might be good for people just to lean in a little bit more and listen to the healthcare hustle and kind of be inspired. Uh, well. <laughs> so those, those that's the homework for our viewers. So thank you, Winston, for joining us. Um, you brought a lot of sunshine on this really gloomy weather, foggy life that we've been leading. So uh, thank well. you. Thank you. I'm not complaining having. about the temperature, though. I've been enjoying the fifth mile fifties versus the. Oh, oh, it's a, a, a yeah. much not nicer change of pace. But, but yeah. you know, I, we're getting there. So I know what you mean. Just a you brought a lot of good joy to us. Yeah. <laughs>